state of emergency. There's been several recently. I want to start from small and, and expand it to something big. State of emergency, our house this week ran out of peanut butter. I know. The, the way our children were crying and screaming, you would have thought they lost a limb. We're out of peanut butter. State of emergency. Then you hear about states calling for a state of emergency. Oregon. State of emergency. We don't know how we're going to handle all the people coming to Oregon looking at the eclipse. State of emergency. Colorado. Weeks ago. Running out of pot. Oh, Lord. State of emergency. We laugh because we sit there and go, really? Are we going to get all torqued out of shape? Are we going to lose all of our emotions because we ran out of peanut butter? Because pot is in limited supply? There are greater things that deserve that label state of emergency, things we just prayed about. The relationship that we have with North Korea Serious stuff, important stuff. But perhaps the greatest state of emergency is this. Knowing Jesus Christ. And you can look at it two ways. My prayer is that God would give me opportunities to remind people that there is eternity. This world is not all there is. We were designed for another world, and we should prepare for that other world. And the only way you prepare for it is by knowing Jesus Christ. So in a sense, there's an urgency about the message of hope in Christ that prepares us for eternity. But the other side of this topic of salvation, and perhaps the one that the church needs to hear often, is the state of emergency with those who claim to know Christ, but have no relationship with Christ. See, part of my role as a pastor and as a communicator is to, according to Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, to reprove and rebuke and exhort the body of Christ. This is an exciting job, isn't it? To come before you and encourage you in your faith, but also to help us stop and examine whether we truly are in the faith. Because I'm sure like you, I, or like me, you, have thought to yourself, wow, you know what, that person claims to be a Christian, but boy, they don't act like a Christian. Don't turn to the person next to you. We, we, know, we know who they are. Or think about the coworker, Or think about the person that, Wherever. See, there's a lot of people who profess, but don't possess. Now, your job is not, not to go around and be like, you're in, you're in, you're out, you're out, you're in. You know, we don't go around doing that. But the Bible is very clear and very consistent in its message that there are ways you can tell whether somebody is in or out. I mean, I want to go with you on your profession of faith, and I want to say, cool, you say you're a Christian, awesome. But part of our responsibility as a community is to walk in the truth we claim to know, which is an interesting aspect of the church because we don't really do that because, number one, maybe we don't like conflict. Number two, we've got a lot of issues in our own life. How dare we even try to address other issues in other people's lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we are called to press 
into one another in relationship and spur one another on towards love and good works, according to Hebrews chapter 10. We're called to look out for each other. We're called to say, you know what? You call yourself a follower of Christ, but honestly, the jokes you've been telling lately, they're not honoring to the Lord. You know, the, the way you've been treating your spouse is just not reflective of the spirit of Christ. The way you've been showing disrespect to your mom or your dad, that's not what the Bible endorses. So here's an interesting thing when it comes to the church is that our relationship goes beyond the surfacey and begins to delve into the, the, uh, the, the arenas of how is my life reflecting the love and spirit of Jesus Christ. In a word, you know what this is called? Discipleship. And discipleship, here's the good news, is a process. When you come to know Jesus, it's not all figured out and all taken care of in your life. Once you come to know Jesus, that is just the start of a beginning journey of growing in Christ-likeness. That's discipleship. How are you maturing and looking like Jesus? 1 John chapter 2. Check this out. This is a major theme with John. Here's a disciple of Jesus in his 80s, has, has seen for many decades the, the work of the gospel in people's lives, and he's had a chance to encourage the church, and he does that with these letters here in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And he comes to this place in John, 1st John chapter 2, where he's dealing with the topic of obedience. I will tell you that obedience is the essence of the Christian life. Write that down. And honestly, I think it's tw twit worthy. Tweet worthy. You can tell I do this. Twit. <laughs> I'm a twit. Hey. Maybe that's even twit worthy too, right? Pastor just said twit worthy. Jerk. <laughs> he thinks he's in, but he's not, right? Story of my life, right? So light up the Twitterverse with the essence of the Christian life is obedience. John's writing to a church where he's encouraging obedience. I regularly speak to a church and encourage obedience. I want you to obey Jesus. You want me to obey Jesus. We're all in the same boat. But what does that obedience look like? I think obedience is important because obedience fuels assurance. Again, twit worthy. First John chapter 2. Verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a lot. That's not nice. <laughs> and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... In him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I mean, what do you see there? What, what is obvious from this passage that doesn't require a seminary-trained pastor. What is obvious in 1 John? I mean, any one of us can look at this, no matter what level of education you're at, no matter where you're at in your spiritual maturity, you look at this in these verses, and, and John says what? If you obey God, the truth's in you. If you don't obey God, you're a liar. Let's pray, go home. Easy, right? I wish it was that easy. Because this passage, passage deserves to be unpacked carefully. And, and I think ultimately John's aim is to bring assurance into your life. Because the one thing I affirm and the Bible affirms 
is that once you are in Christ, you are saved forever. I believe in this very fascinating doctrine called eternal security. Okay? Write those two words down, eternal security. I've, I've run into too many Christian schizophrenics in my life, okay? I've run into too many Christians wondering today, does he love me? Does he not love me? Where am I at with God, right? They don't have this security, this confidence, this assurance that I believe the Bible wants you to have. God is not a capricious, whimsical God who wants you to be guessing about your eternal destiny day in and day out. He wants you to live out of the assurance that you are in Christ, that Christ has you, and there's nothing that could ever happen in your life to separate you from his love, Romans chapter 8. Don't you want this assurance? I mean, how many times, honestly, have you left church and you're like, boy, I wonder if I'm saved or not. Pastor's message was, wow, it was strong. Boy, he said things I've never thought about before. Like, am I really a Christian? No, I don't seek to set you on a course every Sunday where you're questioning your faith intentionally. I do want to affirm the fact that if you love Jesus, there are things you can know that fuel that assurance. But if you're questioning, perhaps today's message is for you. There's four things I want to look at concerning assurance, and, and here they are. Number one, knowing God, the foundation of a, assurance. Number two, loving God, the fuel of assurance. Number three, there is obeying God, which is the focus for assurance. And number five, there is imitating God, which is the fruit for assurance. You get those blanks? And yes, they're all the same letter because I need it easy like you need it easy, right? So we've got what? Foundation, we've got fuel, we've got focus, we've got fruit. Let's start with knowing God. And I'm going to tell you, these four points build upon the other. What is foundationally important, John says throughout his gospel, throughout his letters, that you know God. He says, you must know God and that knowing God must go beyond just intellectual understanding of God. There's a lot of people who know about God. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus but who really knows and loves him deeply? See, this week I had a conversation with a friend who was curious about salvation when it comes to Catholicism, when it comes to Orthodox Church, when it comes to mainstream Protestantism. And right here at Sozo Coffee, there was a discussion right there at that table and we were talking about what does it mean to know God? Because he expressed knowing God ultimately as standing before him and hoping you've done enough good things in your life that the scales teeter favorably in your direction. And if you've done enough good stuff and the scales teeter favorably in your direction, God says, come on in. And I basically had to break the news to my friend that that's not how God works. He's like, really? Because I told my daughter this, and now I've got to go back and have another conversation with her. And right at that table this week, I opened up Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, has nothing to do with good works, it's entirely of God. And why is it entirely of God? Because God doesn't want anyone to boast about getting into heaven on their own accord. And then in verse 10 it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So I wanted to affirm the good works that my friend was bringing up, but it's not good works that get you into heaven. Good works is not the foundation of your eternal life. It is the result of eternal life. But what gets you into heaven? Faith. Through grace in what? Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the gospel. 
That's the good news. Because if you're relying on your own good works, how can you have assurance? Because some of you already messed up an hour ago, right? And you're going, I don't have assurance because I yelled at my wife just in the car right over here, right? I, I broke the law last night. The cop pulled me over. I was speeding. Like, we will never have assurance if we're focused on our own works. This is why John says, look at verse 3. By this we know, we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So, he's talking about the importance of keeping commandments, but notice the word know, it appears twice there. Circle the first time, circle the second time. See, the first know is an ongoing maturing and knowing God. This comes through experience, this comes through relationship. But the second know is foundational because you can't mature in a relationship you have never entered into. And how do we know we've entered into relationship with Jesus? If we obey his commandments, if we keep his commandments. So know for certain this morning, church, that if you obey his commandments, you have come to know him. You have entered into an intimate relationship with him. That there is something remarkable that God has done for us through the person work of Christ and you can have assurance today that if you've come to know Jesus through the cross through his death burial resurrection you truly know him that's foundational amen so it's a great place to start but what does that knowing lead to number two loving God so you have the foundation for assurance Jesus If there's any other foundation in your life, you do not have assurance. So the foundation of our lives must be Jesus Christ. His perfect life, his perfect substitute for us. But you don't just stop at knowing because true knowing in relationship should lead to loving. 25 plus years I've been with my wife in knowing her. And that knowing has resulted in loving her. And I'm still amazed, and I'm going to share something with you she doesn't even know. So this, honey, I don't want to embarrass you. But there are things that my wife says or does. I sit there and go, I've really never noticed that before. And by noticing it, it only makes me love her more. So I really encourage my wife. She works so hard, and I really want to encourage her to nap. And I'm like, you, I'll, I'll do whatever I can. Like, I'll put on Phineas and Ferb for the kids, close the doors, soundproof the room, turn the AC down to 62, be like, take a nap. You need to rest. But one thing I've noticed lately that she does as she's preparing to take a nap, she's lying down, you know, she's she's slipping into REM stage, whatever. Her hand does this. No, no, yeah, yeah. Maybe (laughs) she's she's tweeting. She's tweeting as she's preparing to. But I looked over at her and I'm working, I have an upstairs office and I can see into the into the bedroom, and there's my wife preparing to enter into to nappy land and her hand's doing this and she does it frequently. First time I've seen it in 25 years. And I'm sitting there going, it's a precious husband moment, right? Like, I can't wait. And, and I was thinking like, should I give her a heads up? I'm, nope, I'm just going to share it with the church. <laughs> so maybe here's your secret communique to Lori. Like, did she nap? Did you be like, Lori, <laughs> did it happen? Did you... But you know what? By knowing her, by paying attention to her, by watching her, by observing her, by by being in relationship with her, it's it's things like that that you sit there and go, I'm still growing in understanding this woman. And how much more with God does he invite us in to that level of, of participation and intimacy and observation? And God is saying, you want to love me? You've got to spend time with me. See, the fuel for your assurance is exactly that, spending time with God. Nothing is more important of your time. You need to spend time with the one you say you have allegiance to. If you say you know God, the question is, are you spending time with him? Are you loving him? 
Because knowing him truly will lead to loving him, and loving them then leads to knowing him more, and knowing him more leads to more loving, and it's this cool cycle. And so God says to you, I want you to live your life, here's some Latin for you, Coram Deo. Coram Deo, we live our lives in the presence of God always. And when you spend time, Coram Deo, in the presence of God, you'll understand Him and you'll understand the purposes of God for your life. I truly believe if you're desiring to understand where God wants to take you, what God's doing in you and through you, you've got to spend time, Coram Deo, in His presence. If there's no relationship and no intimacy in that relationship, there's no way love is going to take place. So he says, John, know him, keep his commandments, because if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you know what? You're a liar. It's like if I came to you and said, yeah, I'm married to, to Lori Morgan. And you're like, oh yeah, tell me about her. I don't know, i 25 years ago, we, we met, and I really haven't spent much time with her. And you'd be like, you haven't married her. You have not entered into a relationship. I could tell you truthful things, but if I can't tell you about her heart, if I can't tell you about her life, if I can't tell you the things that make this woman tick, the things that cause her joy, the co- things that cause her sorrow, you know what? I'm a liar. And the truth is not in me. And yet, verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, whoever spends their time in intimacy, loving him, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Meaning, God is the initiator of planting his love in your heart, and he's promised not just to start it, but he's promised to grow it. It's being perfected. We are in process in growing in our love and affection to God. Isn't that awesome? See, we think... The, the walking the aisle and raising the hand at the crusade and making that decision for Christ is the end-all, be-all. I'm going to tell you, it is the start of a long journey. And it is called discipleship. It is called growing. It is called nurturing. It is called just continuing to, to desire intimacy with God. So knowing leads to loving. Loving then leads to more knowing. More knowing leads to more loving. Isn't that awesome? So we have the foundation and we have the focus or the fuel of assurance. But now let's lead to some very practical things, and these are the last two points. Number three, obeying God. And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time because this is, I believe, the, the heartbeat of John's message. What does obedience look like in your lives? See, some of you got a little excited prematurely because you're like, wow, we're only point three. He's only been preaching for 15 minutes. But this is, this is the heart. Because like I said before, the essence of the Christian life is obedience. If we truly lived in a country that is made up of 80% evangelicals, things would be dramatically different than they are. Amen? Where is the obedience in the lives of God's people? And I don't speak as one divorced from the church. I, am in the, I work for the church. I work for God, but I work at a church. I love my job. But I am not afraid to call the people of God to accountability. What is the importance of obedience? This is the focus for assurance. You can be assured if you obey God. But I need to unpack obedience and have you understand it with four important statements right there in your in your notes number one it's preciousness over worthlessness it's readiness over reluctance it's seriousness over insignificance and it's desire over competence this is these were just random musings this week as i'm thinking about obedience It's preciousness, it's readiness, it's 
seriousness. It's desire. And I want, I want to tell you why this is important. You can o- be obedient and not have your heart connected to your obedience. Okay? All the words I deliberately picked out have to do with our hearts involved in our spirituality. One thing the Bible talks about, Jesus talks about, is to make sure we're not doing anything that does not come from deep within. Right? The Bible says in the Old Testament, to obey is better than sacrifice, right? The internal work of of loving God is better than the external motions we tend to go through. See, it is it's easy to put a facade up and fake everybody out. Right? Oh, oh, Joe must be a Christian because we saw him sit in church on Sunday. Just because you sit in church doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than living in a barn makes you a cow. Moo, right? See, what we have to understand is that there are a lot of people who love God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Those are the teachings of Jesus. He says to religious leaders of his day, you know what? You're, you're whitewashed sepulchers on the outside, you're whitewashed tombs on the outside, but inside your lives are filthy, dirty. That's why Jesus didn't write the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Jesus' aim was always for the heart. It's not necessarily what you do, it's why you do what you do. See, what you do is a test of who you are. You can tell us night and day that you love Jesus, but if your character and your conduct doesn't reflect Jesus, your testimony, I believe, is worthless. In John's words, can I say this? You're a liar. Can you imagine telling somebody to their face, like, you're a liar? Can I tell you, I've had that opportunity. It's not my spiritual gift, all right? Boy, he's got the spiritual gift of truth telling and telling people that they're a liar. But I'll tell you what, I have called people to accountability who have not exemplified the spirit of Christ. And in love, I have gone to them and essentially said, your testimony is a fraud. You are a liar. You think those people hang out with me anymore? But I mean, John's saying it to us. He's saying it to me. He's saying it to you. Especially. If you're in a place where you say you love God, but you don't keep his commandments. He's calling you out. But for good reason. Would you rather to have a fake relationship predicated on falsehood and untruth or a relationship that knows they want what's best for me? Right? I mean, we could fake it. If you guys want fake relationships, I mean, I, I, can, I know some places you can go for those kind of relationships. But I want to have a relationship where someone's willing to say, Scott Morgan, you say you love Jesus, but there is something in your behavior that doesn't reflect the the, the spirit of Christ, and I I want to address that with you. Belief and behavior goes together hand in hand. Write that down. I won't say that's Twitter-worthy, but it's good. Belief and behavior go hand in hand. But why is this important? Because preciousness and and seriousness and desire and readiness, those are all important. Why? Because here's the foundational thing that fuels all this, and it's the fact of remembering what God's done for you. Why do we obey? Because he died for me. Why do we obey? He gave his life for me. And if you understand the awesome gift God has given to you, our response is obedience. Your response is to say, you move mountains to, to save this, this, this life. You went to the cross to save me. You ask whatever you want, and I'm going to give it to you. That's the heart of obedience. And I will say that obedience stems from your understanding of the richness of God's love. 
You ever thought about that? I have never received a gift of value and treated it as if it was trash. And if I think about the fact that God has loved me with this love that is beyond description, a love I did not deserve, boy, I tell you what, I want to return to Him an incredible heart of thankfulness and gratitude and a willingness to say, whatever you want, Lord, it's yours. That's obedience. And so, John says, the assurance of your salvation is unattainable without obedience to God's commands. There's no way around it. We are called to obey. It's like the game when we were kids, and I stole this story from a, a pastor friend. Simon Says, right? You guys ever play Simon Says? I can think back to, to my neighborhood where we played this all the time, and you know this is a game we used to play, and Simon Says, right? You, you pat your head, you pat your head. Simon Says, lift your leg, you lift your leg. Simon Says, you jump, right? But in the church, we have Jesus says, and it's a whole different game. Because Jesus says, and we don't do it. <laughs> right? It's like, oh yeah, Jesus says, and, and we treat it as if it's not important. I mean, think about my kids. They're, they're growing, and they're taking on more responsibility. And if I said to, to my daughter, Riley, Daddy says, go clean your room. And she comes back. I say, did, did you clean your room, Riley? No. But I memorized what you told me, Dad. Dad said, Riley, go clean your room. I wasn't asking you to memorize what I told you to do. I wanted you to do what I asked you to do. Oh, Dad, I got some girlfriends coming over. We're going to do a Bible study about what Dad says about cleaning his room. There's a conference coming to town. Clean your room conference. We're going to go to the conference. There's a bestseller out right now at the Christian bookstore called Clean Your Room. We're going to go get that book and read it. We are masters at reciting things back to God that we've memorized and books we've read and conferences we've gone to, but we are horrible at actually doing what God has called us to do. Go make disciples. How many of you are making disciples? That's what I thought. How many of you are loving your enemies? How many of you are praying without ceasing? How many of you are guarding the anger in your heart because it amounts to murder? How many of you are guarding the lustful thoughts that your brain entertains because that's adultery? How many of you hear Jesus says and you don't do what Jesus says? I'm guilty. See, obedience responds to the teachings of Jesus, the commands of Jesus. They may not make sense. They may seem like the hardest thing to do. But when God says to do something, my response, because he has saved my wretched life from hell, because he has turned my heart of stone into a heart of flesh, my response is saying, your will be done, not my own. God never says, do you like it? He never says, do you agree with it? See, the pride and the hardness of our hearts wants our own way. And you will never get your own way if you have a relationship with God. Because it is His way. It is His will. It is His word. And there's no other way around it. Pastor wrote this, and I love his words, and I, and I just want to read it for you. He says, keeping God's commandments is a key piece of evidence in the chain of proof of your love for God. If you have any spiritual smarts about you, you will pay attention. Do you have an enemy? Forgive him today. Have you wronged or are you wronging someone now? Make it right today. Are you a constantly bad-mouthing brother in Christ? Then lay off your blog and Twitter account and turn off your computer and smartphone for a while. Are you maxed out with credit card debt? Then do some plastic surgery and live on rice and beans and beans of rice, right? Are you lazy? Well, quit lying around and playing video games and look for a job. Do you struggle with cursing or crude language? Remember, we have to give an account for every idle word we speak, so clean out your mouth. 
Do you, do you play the lottery or slink off to the casino? Well, quit trying to gain something with, with, that, with nothing for you to win. Thousands of others have to lose. Are you a social drinker who thinks it's cool or even necessary to fit in with the contemporary culture? Then try abstinence. Are you a two-faced hypocrite? Then get right with God and yourself and stop the junk and hide charade. Bring all the junk and broken pieces of your life to Jesus and he will forgive you, heal you, restore you, and set you free to walk in obedience to his will. Did that hit somebody today? God never asks you to do something according to his will without giving you the power to do it. Because some of you are saying, I can't. Exactly. But God can. Or you're saying, I can't, because really you mean, I won't. God is honored when you come to him and say, I don't know how, but if it's what you want, help me. Because here it is. Preciousness over worthlessness. His word is precious. His word is sweeter than honey that comes from the honeycomb. His word is a lamp to our feet as we stumble around in darkness. We need a light. See, the preciousness of what God says is not something to be treated as worthless. If we say this is the word of God, how come we just treat it like a phone book? Yes, I'm old. If this is the living, active word of God, this ought to be precious to our lives. That love letter from a God who says, I want you to know about me, I want you to know about my heart, and I want you to know about my will for your life. Well, here it is. See, it's about readiness over reluctance. Meaning, God, I come to you and I'm ready. Help me with my reluctant attitude. Help me with my reluctant uh, mentality. He's, he's wanting a, a, a man or a woman that says, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to trust you. I'm ready. God, I want to take seriously what you have said. There's a seriousness to what God says for me today. And the last thing, desire over confidence, and this is the good news, right? God values desire more than he values competence. Meaning, but I don't pray good. None of us do. Amen? None of us know how to read the Bible well. None of us do. But you know what God wants? A heart that desires. A heart that wants, yearns. And he says, I will meet you. I will meet you there. Because he's not looking for you to, to, to do everything perfectly. He l- wants you to just make the movement and say, this is what I desperately want. He values desire over competence. Can I tell you how long that truth has been sitting with me in my life for a long time? Because I'm incompetent. It's okay. But if the desire's there, God is honored in that. Amen? Last point. So where, and, and can I just real quick just give you, there's a great account in the Gospels with the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Because he's, this this is, the, this is the illustration, right, in the Gospels. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, how do I get eternal life? Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And the rich young ruler says, good, I've done that. And Jesus is like, okay, this guy needs a little bit deeper surgery, right? He says, go sell all you have and give all of it to the poor. And the man left heartbroken because he didn't want to part with his riches see this is a man who knew but he didn't know this is a man who said he obeyed god right yeah i love god with all my heart soul mind and strength jesus says well then obey him and stop loving your finances more than you love god well because he wouldn't walk away from his finances right then and there he was obviously in complete disagreement with the first commandment to truly love your god see he had an idol that he 
would not get rid of. And Jesus has that account there for all of us to say to us that there's nothing more important than him. Your cars, your houses, your relationships, your money, your hobbies, your dogs, your cats, whatever you may hold on to, God's saying, love me first more than anything. Which then leads to the ultimate fruit for assurance, imitating God. Paul says in Ephesians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says in Corinthians, imitate God. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, God's given us a model to live our lives. John chapter 15 says, abide in me and I will abide in you. See, what is the ultimate fruit for assurance in our lives? Is that if people meet you and they say, wow, I think I just met Jesus. In talking with you, they just felt like, boy, I just felt like I just talked to Jesus. This is an awesome truth because what does John say? He says, as the fans blown my Bible pages close, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. By this we know that we are in him, union with him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk. Circle that word walk. This is every life, everyday life behavior. This is every day life demonstration. We walk in the same manner as he walked. Now, my first question is, is this possible? Because I'm sitting there going, he walked on water. He multiplied fishes and loaves of bread. He healed people, raised them from the dead. Really, is God asking me to do that? No. But he is asking you to live a fully surrendered life so that your behaviors look more like Christ. Your, your, the way you talk looks more like Christ. Your overall attitude is more like Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, write these two words down. There's an active part and there's a passive part to this. And this is the secret. I'm going to tell you guys a secret that so many people miss out on. And I will tell you, because it's always good to have a Charles Spurgeon quote in the message somewhere. An unchanged life is the sign of an uncleansed heart. See, imitating God is, is, is a vital characteristic of our lives because John talks about abiding and that abiding ultimately leads to imitating. And so we need to understand that there's an active abiding and there's a passive abiding. Let me talk about active abiding just momentarily. Philippians chapter 3, write it down. There are things we do, there are practices we embrace, there are disciplines we have as believers in Christ that are good in our relationship with God. Paul says it like this in Philippians chapter 3. I make it my aim to know him, to know the power of his resurrection, to be in fellowship with his sufferings, and to be conformed to his death. Now that's a pretty intense list there. But in the context, Paul's saying, I'm laying aside all the things I used to love in this world, and I, I consider them as rubbish for the sake or the goal of knowing God, knowing Christ. And, and you actively have to realize that it coincides with the teachings of Jesus, Luke chapter 9, right? If you're going to follow me, what? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and, fo and follow me. There's an active sense where I have to w daily wake up and go, this is not about me. I mean, start your day with those words. Lord, today is not about me. I tell you what, I, I could teach a seminar on that, right? And sell millions of tickets because how many of us wake up and we immediately think, well, today's about me. How will my wife serve me? How will my kids serve me? How will my friends and relations serve me? Because you know what? The world revolves around me. Has anyone been guilty of that mentality? Yeah, liars. All right, so. See, there's an active part of denying myself, taking up my cross, dying to my will, my ways, my desires, and, and following Jesus and saying, you're going you're gonna to call the shots in my life. 
There's an active sense where I, I, I go to the scriptures and I go, okay, what is this showing uh, about my heart? Too many times we look at the Bible and say, oh, my friend Dave needs to hear this verse. Oh, boy, I heard a guy on the radio say something. I can't wait to go to, go to you know, Mary about this thing and, you know, tell her all about it. You know, first and foremost, every day begins with you doing just some hard examination in your own life. This is the active component of saying, I'm going to abide with Jesus and let him just shine his light into my own life. Show me where I need to change, Father. Show me where I need to to tweak something. Show me where I'm, I'm wrong. Show me where there's sin. And there's an active component about pursuing these things. But perhaps we miss out on one of the most important elements, and that is the passive obedience that God wants from us, which is the beauty of the word abiding. And you've heard me illustrate this before. When you have a tree that grows fruit, and I've tried to do this, and I'm not a good, I, I kill plants, just so you guys know. I kill trees, all right? But I go out, and I, I, I can acknowledge the beauty of fruit growing from a tree, right? I've eaten apples off a tree before. But here's one thing about nature that I know that you probably know as well, that the apple has to do nothing but live sucking the nutrients from the tree. The, the apple doesn't strain to grow. The apple doesn't groan. It is passively receiving something that it itself cannot produce. Well, this is the beauty of abiding with Christ, John chapter 15. Abide with Jesus, and a natural outgrowth of his work in you will be imitating him. You don't have to force it. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to coerce it to take place. Your abiding has a passive aspect of it where it's just going to happen. You spend time with him, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna become like him. And so John wants you to know this. That's why Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night to saying, there's amazing things you're doing. We want to know the secret. And Jesus says, Just so you know, the Son of Man does not do these things of himself. It is entirely of the Father's work in him. How many of us are guilty in trying to make things happen when the result should be a natural outgrowth of just spending time with him? The relationship that he says, I promise to nurture you and and feed you and fuel you and give you the things you, you don't need to do anything but live in Him. When was the last time we did? I spent another con- This week was filled with spiritual conversations at Sozo Coffee. I s- stood with a man towards the back there, who was crying. Grown man, big dude, crying. Because he has lost sight of what it means just to stop and slow down. And be still and know that he is God. And he's crying back here. And he says, as a pastor, what is your advice to me? And I said, well, my advice to you is the same advice that I give myself. You're a human being, not a human doing. Amen? We, we think that being busy is, is like the hallmark of succeeding. Man, my life hasn't slowed down. When do you want to meet? Well, I've got six months from now that might be open. And we wear this as a badge of honor when in reality God is saying, when was the last time you just stopped and were in my presence, sat in my lap, sat at my feet? I said, brother, your cup is empty. You've been giving and serving and doing, and and we just need to stop and be filled again. And what does Jesus promise? Exactly that. Why do you think he had the issue with Mary and Martha, right? Martha's busy in the kitchen, but Mary's at the feet, and Jesus says, Mary's chosen the better thing. You need to hear this. God says, abide in Christ, and he's going to abide in you. Quit looking busy for God and just spend time in his presence. Let him be your portion. Say to him, I am available, and know that 
you can depend on Him and He will find that eager, available heart and He will be glad to fill it and work in it and work through it. Because if these things aren't present, it's, it's fake. You guys remember when I showed you that fake $50 bill? A while back, some of you were like, no. Yeah, it was probably three years ago. And I can't find it. There's a fake $50 bill floating around somewhere. Now, a fake d- bill doesn't get you anywhere, but even though it does maybe get some traction in some places, I carried that $50 bill around m- with me because I accepted it here at Sozo, and I realized it was a counterfeit. I was like, ah! It looked good. I took it to the bank, and they're all like, ooh, this is a good counterfeit. I was surprised they didn't take it from me. They just give it back. I'm like, hey, have fun with it. But this week I found out that there's something fake that I, I got. So I ordered off Amazon my Eclipse sunglasses. So I got a pack of 10 for 5 bucks. Now when the Amazon guy comes to our door, my wife's like, oh great, what did my husband order now? So I ordered this weeks ago. Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be a nerd and a week from tomorrow go out and look at the eclipse with my sunglasses on. Well, Amazon just sent me an email two days ago saying, your sunglasses are fake. Like, I don't have a backup plan, you guys. You don't know me, do you? But imagine, I mean, it says solar eclipse glasses. It says uh, ISO certified, whatever that means. Imagine if I didn't know they were fake and I went out with my children like, hey, kids, let's look at the eclipse. And they're all like, no, my eyes are burning, right? This is a fake. Yet the packaging looks so good. They look like they're, all the reviews said these are good glasses. Well, Amazon just said they will not work. We don't suggest <laughs> using them. See, they are counterfeit. And you sit there and go, why is that a big reason? Because if I did not realize these were counterfeit, even though the outer packaging looks good, it's harmful. I could harm myself. I could harm others I love. See, it's the same thing with counterfeit Christianity. Yeah, I mean, the packaging may be all there. You may be Jesus certified on the outside. You may have good reviews from other people. But I tell you what, if deep down inside they are not tr- you're not truly who you claim to be, it is harmful. It's not just harmful to the world. It's not harmful as the witness. Perhaps the most harm is because you sit self-assured that you have something you don't. And I just wanted to say, today is the day you come to the light. Today's the day you take a different route. Stop trafficking in unlived truth. And be the man or woman God wants you to be today. That's where assurance is. When the lights are off and no one's looking, it's just you and God and you have Jesus and that is the only hope you cling to. You can be assured that you're in the right place. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. And if you want some solar glasses, I have some for you, all right? (laughs) Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us, for giving us 1 John, for giving us a song to sing, for giving us time to pray for our country. Lord, our prayer is that you have been glorified in this place by your people. Set for us a course to live our lives. Help us to begin the journey And even if it means just stopping and abiding, then so be it. That's a great thing. Lord, thank you for Jesus, our hope and our help and our everything. Be glorified in our lives. Help us to point others to you. Empower us to live for your glory and our good. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.